In this video, we'll look at how to incorporate boost converters in our PCB designs, looking at their functioning, their on and off states, then going over to PCB design layout and routing, seeing what aspects of PCB design are critical, where we need to keep loop errors small, how we can handle our sensitive feedback traces, and so on. We'll go through the workings of the device because we need to understand this to then implement a good PCB design, seeing the various states of our boost converter and what this means for us for PCB design layout and routing. And then of course, looking at a practical example of a typical boost converter, looking at both the schematic setup as well as then the PCB design layout and routing, we'll show you a demonstration of how I would lay and route this out. We won't be going into detail on part selection in this video, but I will be making a video in the near future on part selection, how to choose diodes, inductors, input output capacitors, and so on. I also have two videos on buck converter, so step down converter design, that's video number 60, looking at the PCB design aspects, and video number 71, looking at buck converter component selection and sizing. So how do we choose inductors, input output capacitors, and so on. And therefore, in this video, I'd like to do a very similar thing for boost converters, first looking at the PCB design, and in a future video, looking at component selection and sizing. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. Even though this video is ECAT tool agnostic, I'll be showing you how I would lay out and route one of these boost converters using Altium Designer. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below, or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial, as well as 25% off your first license purchase. Let's first of all talk about the functioning of a boost converter, because this will be important when we need to design our PCB, do the layout and routing, and what loops and areas we need to pay particular attention to. As the name suggests, a boost converter steps up voltage. So we have a DC input power source, maybe at five volts, and we use a boost converter to then step that up from five volts, maybe to 10 volts, to 15 volts, and so on. These can be very useful if your input voltage or input voltage source is very limited and we need a higher output voltage. The nice thing is that this is a switching converter, meaning we typically have very high efficiency and we can have quite high output current capabilities. Boost converters come in many forms, there are many ICs available, and choosing components, also the surrounding circuitry, is again a video in its own right. But effectively, all we need to know for now, we have a lower input voltage and want a higher output voltage, and this is a switching converter. I'll leave a link to this wiki page in the description below the video. This is actually quite well written. A circuit of a very basic boost converter I've drawn up here. On the left hand side, we have a DC power source. And on the right hand side of the output, we connect it to some sort of load. This might be an IC, op amps, whatever requires this higher output voltage. Again, V in on the left hand side is lower than V out on the right hand side. The question then is, how do we even generate a higher output voltage when we only have a lower input voltage? That might seem a bit odd to start off with. It turns out this is actually quite a neat solution. On the left hand side, we start by feeding our power source and connecting that to an input capacitor. This is to provide local energy storage for our boost converter, our switching circuitry. Effectively, our voltage source feeds our input capacitor, charges this up, and the charge on the input capacitor is then used in our switching converter. Our switching converter predominantly consists of input and output capacitors, but also a magnetic element, L, which is an inductor, a switch, which is typically a MOSFET, as well as a series diode. This is similar, but quite different to a buck converter. We still have the same elements, diode, switch, in terms of a transistor and a magnetic element, as well as input and output capacitors. However, the arrangement is quite different. The switch itself is controlled by a controller. Effectively, it needs an appropriate gate drive circuitry that alters the duty cycle and the voltage applied to the gate of a typical FET. By varying the duty cycle, we'll see that the output voltage will change appropriately. To actually then sense this output voltage, we typically have a feedback network consisting of a resistor divider, so R feedback one, R feedback two, that feeds back into our controller, and therefore we have a closed loop feedback system to adjust the duty cycle depending on what output voltage we want. This is the overall circuit diagram for a boost converter, but to actually understand its functioning, we need to look at two different states. The state of when this switch is closed, effectively our FET is on, and when our switch is open, when our FET is off. This on and off state I've drawn up and simplified in this picture. On the top hand side, we have the switch in its on state. The bottom side, we have the switch in its off state. Let's look at the on state first. 
When the switch is on, effectively our gate voltage to our switch, which is our FET, is high enough. So effectively we have a short in place of our FET. Of course there will be some on-state resistance and some losses, but effectively we can think of that as a short. So our switch node, which comes after the inductor, is effectively pulled to ground. With the switch node effectively pulled to ground, this node of the inductor, remember we had a diode on the right hand side of the inductor, and since the output voltage is not negative, it's either greater or equal to zero at this point or any point in time, if the switch node is zero, effectively the diode is reverse biased and we have an open circuit. Therefore our main loop consists of C in, our inductor L, and our closed switch. Therefore we have a current flow from C in through our inductor L through the closed switch. And we build up a voltage on our inductor L, so V in on one side, and the switch node being grounded essentially on the other side. And that's when our switch is on. The interesting thing then happens after we've charged up essentially our inductor, which stores its energy in the form of a magnetic field. The interesting thing happens when we turn this switch off. So we open the switch. And this is shown on the bottom hand side. The circuitry remains completely the same, except that our switch is now off and effectively we have an open circuit. Once we have an open circuit, the voltage at the switch node of course isn't grounded anymore, it's not zero. It turns out that the inductive element, the voltage across it, actually switches polarity. We remember we haven't discharged any of the energy yet contained in the magnetic element from this previous switch on state, so we have energy stored in the inductor, and upon opening switch, the voltage across the inductor changes polarity. Looking at the source as well, we have a source going from negative to positive, and then in series with the negative to positive voltage inductor, meaning our input voltage and our inductor voltage adds together. Therefore the voltage seen at the switch node now is simply the sum of the input voltage plus the voltage we generated across the inductor when our switch was on. As the switch node voltage is now the input voltage plus some voltage across the inductor, this will now forward bias our diode. Then simply, the diode of course is non-ideal and has a forward voltage drop, so our output voltage is whatever is at the switch node, so our input voltage plus inductor voltage minus the forward diode drop, and that's our output voltage. And this is how, due to this inductor voltage, we can generate an output voltage that is higher than our input voltage source. So quite a clever trick. As we'll see in a future video on component selection, it's of course important what value and, and size, also current ratings this inductor has, as well as if we can minimize the forward voltage drop on our diode. This of course needs to be able to handle the current, how do we size our switches, input and output capacitors and so on. Looking again at the wiki page, we can see that the output voltage divided by the input voltage is dependent predominantly in continuous mode on the duty cycle. So the output voltage is 1 over 1 minus the duty cycle times the input voltage. So if the duty cycle, the amount of time the switch is on compared to that amount of time the switch is off, is very low, so for the most part the switch is off, then of course the output voltage will be pretty much the input voltage. However, the closer the duty cycle gets to 1, so the more the switch is on compared to how long the switch is off for, the output voltage will be higher than the input voltage. We can see this plotted here. On the x-axis we have the duty cycle between 0 and 1, on the y-axis we have the output voltage, and I've just set my input voltage to 1 volt. So if our duty cycle is 0, we get the same output voltage as the input voltage, and as we increase the duty cycle, we can see our output voltage rises as we approach duty cycle equals 1. For us then as PCB designers, what does this mean? Where do you have to pay attention? As usual with switching converters, we need to think about, for example, high current loops, and what loops there are in these designs. With any loop, especially if it's high frequency and high current, we want to keep those loops as tight and small as we can, minimizing inductances. The most important loop and the most important node in this type of boost converter is the switch node. As we saw, this is tied directly to our FET switch, and this will switch at many kilohertz and even in the megahertz. So the switching node will be a fairly high current and high frequency node, and therefore we need to keep this node pretty small. We also want to keep our loops tight. So for example, when the switch is on, we have a loop from our C in through to our magnetic element in the inductor and through our switch. So we have this one loop in the center. When the switch is off, however, and we're discharging effectively our magnetic element, we have this larger loop from C in through the inductor, through the diode, the output capacitor and back. So we have these two states and therefore these two main loops. Remember also keeping the switch node small. The part we'll be looking at in this video for which I'll also show you the PCB layout and routing, is by Texas Instruments, this TPS6104. This is a fairly low power DC-DC boost converter in a fairly nice package, a SOT23 5 pin package. With an input voltage range of 1.8 to 6 volts and an output voltage up to 28 volts, 
and various current handling requirements, up to one megahertz switching frequency, which we can set and useful for a various number of applications. Again, in a future video, we'll actually look at how to choose one of these parts and also how to select the surrounding circuitry. If we scroll down to the typical application schematic, we should recognize a few elements which we just saw in the circuit description. Typical boost converter packages will include the switching circuitry, of course, the controller and various other functionalities, for example, maybe a soft start, an able signal and so on. What we then have to connect are, of course, the input output capacitors, our magnetic element, our inductor, series diode, and of course, our feedback network to then set the output voltage. If you don't want to wait to the next video, you can always follow the data sheets and the data sheet recommendations for part selection. This particular TPS61040, I actually used one of my USB-C headphone amplifier designs, following the data sheet to pick suitable parts, as we'll see in a future video. For this design, I had a 5 volt input supply voltage from my USB connection, but I needed about a 16 or 15 volt output to feed some audio op amps. Therefore, for this, I used a boost converter. Again, we have our input capacitor, our magnetic element, series diode, output capacitor, as well as our feedback network. The feedback network, of course, sets the output voltage when taken from the data sheet. We can find out what value these resistors have to be to generate about 16 volts output. C9 is a compensation capacitor and oftentimes recommended in parallel with one of these feedback dividers to speed up the feedback loop across a certain band. When we move over to PCB layout and routing, what we need to take care of is of course short loops, for example C8 to our U1 package to our boost converter, as well as our magnetic element L1. Then of course our switch node is very important and that's why I like to color code all of this as well. Our switch node needs to be kept only the size it needs to be to be able to handle the current, but no larger. We don't want any extra capacitance on this node as it's a high frequency, fairly high current node. Again, keeping loops of the input and the output short and small, keeping our loops tight as we'll see. But then we also have this feedback circuitry, R4, R5, C9, as well as our feedback trace that needs to be kept reasonably short and far away from, for example, high speed signals or magnetic elements and circuitry that could act as an aggressor. Now let's move over to the PCB design layout and routing. Data sheets will often have recommended layout and routing guidelines, as is also the case for the part we're using in this design. And this can oftentimes be a useful starting point, but depending on what package sizes you choose, and there are sometimes contradicting guidelines in these application notes or other outdated guidelines, then it can be a quite a good idea to start from this layout, but then adjust it to match sensible guidelines. As we see in this layout over here, the switch node is very large, larger than it needs to be. Remember we said the switch node is high frequency and can be very high current, and we don't want to add more capacitance than is necessary. We only want to make, for example, the switch node large enough or as large as it needs to be to be able to handle the current. And of course, we could maybe move the diode in closer and the inductor in closer. We could also, for example, improve the loop areas as they are quite wide and so on. So let's see how we can lay out and route such a device manually, just by following sensible guidelines, minimizing our loop areas, paying attention to high frequency switching nodes, and making sure our feedback circuitry is in order as well. On the PCB, this is a four layer PCB. Top layer are pretty much all of my components, bottom layer just routing, and my inner two layers are ground and ground. So my top layer has a good reference and my bottom layer has a good reference. Then of course I need to stitch these ground planes together with all these stitching views. But anyway, that's the first guideline is that I would like to have a solid ground and return plane closely coupled to wherever my switching converter is on. For two layer boards, typically the ground plane, which is our bottom layer typically, will be very, very far away. Meaning if you can, is make your dielectric space thinner. So use maybe a 0.8 millimeter thickness board or even lower, or switch to a four layer design where we have a very thin dielectric between layer one and layer two with our ground plane below. We also see we have a crystal oscillator in this design, and of course you want to keep our magnetic element or our switching converter pretty far away from circuitry such as this. Therefore, maybe you want to put our magnetic element and our switching converter somewhere far away, maximizing our space between sensitive elements. Our actual IC package is this SOT23 five pin package. We have our input voltage node at five, our enable signal at four, our critical switch node at one, our overall ground connection at two, and our feedback node at pin three. Remember, we want to keep our loop small, so C8 to U1. We want to keep our switch node tight and small with L1 and D3 and C10, and our feedback circuitry away from magnetic elements, for example. Simply following that, and remember, pin 5 is our input voltage pin. Our input capacitor is C8 over here, 
So what I'd do is I'd move that fairly close. Fairly close, meaning for example, something like this is pretty good. If you move it too close, we'll have DRC constraints. But something like this, what we also see is that on the top solder mask layer, we're gonna have this very small sliver. So I actually probably place it a tiny bit further away. Also keeping to account that we need to stay within our solder mask sliver constraints, but somewhat close to the package, this is great. So we've minimized our loop area effectively between this node and that node. Also thinking about our ground returns. I could of course also place our capacitor like so, which maybe would have a better ground return like so, but I of course have to keep in mind that we'll still have to root out everything else and lay out everything else of this switching converter, and especially critical is our boost node. So as a good starting point, something like this for our input capacitor close to our boost converter IC. Then our switching node and also our connection for the inductor, remember our inductor has our input voltage connection as well as the switch node connection. Therefore, with a sensibly sized inductor, this is a fairly small part, I can get very nice and close. For example, like so, this is fairly close, but still adequate spacing between the inductor and our switching converter. I could also just place it a tiny bit further away, which makes assembly, debugging, and so on a bit easier. But again, trying to minimize our loop areas for our input node, as well as our switch node. Keep in mind for the switch node, however, we still have this diode, this series output diode, which we have to place somehow. If we place, for example, our diode like so, we then have this span of an area that is our switch node. Also then, for example, the diode output, which has to connect to our output capacitor, then may be placed like so, which I guess is somewhat okay, but we have this rather large loop and we also increase the size of our switch node. What we could do, and this is always a matter of figuring it out and playing around, is maybe put our diode in line with this switch node. This means spacing out our parts a bit more and having something, for example, like so. Then we can move, for example, our capacitor closer in. We have smaller loops again from the output node as well as our ground nodes. So this might be a slightly better layout and routing than the one we had before. Again, further optimizing, maybe we could even then move our inductor down like so to even further reduce the size of our switch node and also bring our input node closer together. Again, also keeping in mind spacings between parts where we still want to be able to test this, assemble this and so on. So maybe a layout like this would also be okay. Before we had something like this, which increased our input node loop area. So after some iterations, this seems like a fairly sensible layout. We have pretty symmetric placement of output and input capacitors, a fairly small switch node, at least layout wise, fairly small input node, and so on. Always remember that a good layout will make your routing life a lot easier. We of course still have our feedback circuitry, where one side needs to be taken at the output voltage, and this should be taken from the output capacitor, and then we have this high impedance sensitive feedback trace in green, which connects to the effectively our output of our network. Again, taking this whole section, which consists of R4, R5, and C9, we want to place that far away from a magnetic element. We also want to keep this boost feedback node short. So this would probably mean rotating these components, maybe like so, or even a layout like so. Remember, we always want to pre-plan our routes in our head as well. So what we can then do when we come to routing later on, we have an easy path from our output capacitor into our feedback network, and then very short traces, for example, into our feedback node. Of course, there might be more optimal solutions, but something like this is already pretty decent. Again, it's an iterative process, making sure your feedback section is far away from switching nodes, having small loop areas and so on, pre-planning the route in your head as well. But as such, this doesn't seem like a bad initial layout. Of course, there might be things to be able to improve, but this is already a great starting point. This is then how easily I would set up and lay out a switching converter, in this case, a boost converter. We can now place this a bit further away, the switching element pointing away from sensitive circuitry, for example, this crystal oscillator, but still far enough away from the edge of the board. We still want to have a sufficiently large ground plane underneath. So some placement like this might be okay. However, you also have to consider where our input voltage source is coming from, and this is coming from this five volt trace coming from our USB connector, and our output voltage is then fed onto a linear regulator afterwards. So we might have to, to improve routing, rotate this part like so which does mean we're bringing this inductor closer to the oscillator. So therefore, maybe we should move this up a tiny bit and to the right, again, maximizing spacing between magnetic elements and switching nodes and sensitive signals. But in this way, because we have rooted power in this design, I can simply root from my input trace 
first of all, straight into my input capacitor. So not into this input pin, but through my input capacitor in and then in to my IC. For example, like so, trace pretty much as wide as the pad. This whole system is only about 400, 500 milliamps of current peak. So a half millimeter trace is more than sufficient. If you'd like to calculate exactly what trace widths you require, I'd recommend checking out an IPC2221 calculator where you can enter your current requirements, what thickness copper you're using, what temperature rises you're allowed, and then required trace widths for inner or outer layer traces. You can, of course, use polygon pores as well. So for example, we could simply root in to our input capacitor and then do a polygon pore in Ultim Designer, that's P and G, and simply draw sufficiently sized and this is a tiny bit crudely drawn, but you get the idea. We can link all of these up with a fairly low inductance little planelet. Again, just large enough to be able to handle the current requirements, feeding in to our input capacitor first. Pin 4 has nothing to do with power, it's just an unable signal, so that can be a fairly thin trace, maybe 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters. So maybe something like so, we can route in directly to our 5 volt signal. The boost node itself, again, this shouldn't be arbitrarily large. It should only be large enough to carry the current. You could either just route with fairly wide traces to handle the current, something like this, or again, just do a polygon pour, and it only needs to be as large as it needs to be with short, fairly wide connections, wide enough to be able to handle the current requirements. You can see this is not as arbitrarily large as shown in, for example, the datasheet you recommended layout. The output node then, because of our nice layout and placement, is very short, again, sized large enough to be able to handle the output current requirements. For example, something like so. Of course, we could also increase our distance from our switch node to our output node, but something like this is usually fine. You also see I'm actually not using thermal reliefs, even though we might have very small copper imbalances. Typical SMD reflow soldering, this is absolutely fine, as long as there's no huge imbalances. But if there are, you should then, of course, use thermal reliefs on your SMD pads. Before we look at the ground connections, what we then have to do is, of course, route our feedback trace. So what you could do is route a thin trace from the output, taken from the output capacitor, not the diode. And if you want, if you want to take special care, place a via, route on an opposite side layer, come up right next to our feedback network and route in. For this, this is probably pretty overkill. This is already far away enough from sensitive circuitry that we can probably stay on the same layer. But if you have sensitive circuitry around, it could be good to route this on an inner layer, of course, with appropriate references, or on the opposite layer. If you just want to route on the top layer, which is absolutely fine, just take a thin trace, routing in to our feedback network. Again, this one capacitor and our feedback dividers. We can then link this up, and then all we have to do is a fairly thin, short traces going to our feedback node, for example, something like so. Of course, you can clean this up a tiny bit, maybe move around the resistors and capacitors, but the ideas are that this feedback trace and these feedback traces, which are to keep short away, for example, from switch nodes, away from our magnetic element, which is down here, with short traces. Before we get onto our ground connection, then of course we can also take the output. This is from our output capacitor, wide trace, because this is now a current carrying trace, into the next section of our circuitry. And here you can see the difference between our current carrying trace and, for example, our feedback traces going into our resistor divider and feed forward capacitor. As we have internal ground planes, the ground connections are fairly straightforward. All we do is place vias close to a pad. So for example, here I have a 0.7 millimeter via with a 0.3 millimeter drill, and I place pretty much one per pad, not too close and not too far away. You don't want to place it, for example, in the pad and not too close that you get problems with solder wicking. So some distance away, one per pad, for example, like so. Because we want to minimize also loop areas, ideally, we could maybe place, for example, our feedback resistor higher up, which means we can place our ground via close to the central ground point like so. Also with our input capacitor, maybe we could move this a further away and then have the ground via facing more inwards. But to be honest, it's a bit of a compromise anyway, and even connections like these are absolutely fine. This via is a bit too close for my liking to, for example, this pad. So this spacing here is very, very close. So of course you have to maintain proper spacing. So maybe we have to move our output capacitor a bit further like so, and then we can place our via like that. And again, it's an iterative process, making sure you stay within your design rules and far away from them. Thinking about loop areas, these airline connections, for example, the point to point node connections, but also our return path, our ground connections. Because we have a fairly low inductance in a ground plane or set of ground planes, what we can then do is simply use short wide traces connecting to these vias and then let the ground plane do the rest, so to speak. 
there might be a minimal benefit in then also attaching pads like so. But typically, if you have a closely spaced ground layer underneath, having a via connection, this is pretty much sufficient as well. So again, the main points, traces and polygons to be able to handle the currents, keep your loop area small, the switch node only as large as it needs to be, again, loop small, sensitive traces short, far away, for example, magnetic elements, routing into the input capacitor and out into the output capacitor, and keeping your switching converters away from sensitive circuitry. I'd highly recommend now trying this out for yourself, maybe even the same circuitry, the same switching converter, or picking one which is suitable for your system, or maybe you're currently working on a design that involves a boost converter. Think of the loops, the high current loops, the switch nodes, having a good placement then of course leads to an easier routing, but following these guidelines should ensure a good performance of your boost converter. Keep in mind there's also a lot more to switching converter layout and design, depending on the part selections you have, the sizes of components and so on. We've pretty much just scratched the surface, but it should be a great starting point for you to incorporate boost converters and switching converters in your own design. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, please do leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date also for the follow-up video on boost converter component selection and sizing. Thanks again, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.